a lot of homes built before, well, the 70s anyway, were built on post and pier foundations, and it's still a pretty common foundation today. So why did I choose one, and why do I regret it to this day? First of all, the post and pier foundation is a type of foundation, and it's actually fairly common, believe it or not, but it's a type of foundation that you essentially set some kind of pier, that would be concrete blocks, maybe you use like a sono tube or something like that. You drill a hole in the ground, typically below the frost line, and then pour a bunch of concrete, and then on top of that, concrete pier, you set a post. And then on top of the post, you set a beam and you build your house on top of that. It's a fairly simple system and it's pretty common. Now you could, depending on the environment, do like I did and dig down, not necessarily below the frost line, though that is what you're supposed to do. Set pavers, which are concrete bricks essentially, usually about an inch and a half thick and about six by 12 or 8 or something like that and you set those pavers down you know a couple layers of those interlocking with some sand to hold them in place now of course this is after you've dug a trench or something of that nature and then you put a pier block on top of that which is about a 40 pound block of concrete typically with a hole in the center or with a 4x4 four four post section in the center. So you can set your post right on it. Those type of pier blocks are typically used for decks and things of that nature. The type typically used for post and pier foundations, for like a cabin, for example, has a hole in the center of the pier block, and you then drop in one of those galvanized brackets that are designed to nail a four by four on top of, and they have like a threaded rod with a nut on them, and you can adjust the height that way. That's how you level them out. So that's your basics for a post and pier foundation. They're very popular. Now I chose the post and pier foundation, frankly, because it looked fairly easy to build in a remote location, and that was a big concern for me. We are approximately three miles from the nearest paved road on a steep, road that I often call a goat trail. It's not a four by four road. You could get up there in a two wheel drive car during the drier parts of the year, as long as you're willing to risk your tires and maybe your oil pan if you hit a rock, but it's not terribly bad. And a concrete pumper truck could probably get in there or a concrete, just a concrete truck could probably get in there. I've actually had a large dump truck get into my location, though he was very upset about some of the low-hanging branches. He wasn't happy about that, but it is possible for them to get in there. But I looked at it as, we're talking a remote location, and frankly, I just wanted to do it myself. And I didn't want to have to pour a foundation myself. So I decided to use the post and pier foundation. Also, I thought a post and pier foundation would be cheaper. Now, I will tell you when I was doing my research for this particular video, because I don't remember what I researched 15 years ago, I discovered that typically a post and pier foundation is about the same cost as a footing and stem wall foundation. Now, I don't know how that's true, but that's what they say. The average cost for a 2,000 square foot home was like $21,000, they said, for either. <laughs> well, that's not what it cost me. But it, it was simple, it was easy to put in, it wasn't that expensive, and it's held up for 15 years. So why did I do it and why did I regret it? Because of cost and ease and simplicity of build. Seemed like the best option at the time and it was a very popular one. But why do I regret it? <laughs> well, let me tell you, there's a list. And I'm gonna start with the very fact that it's not a very stable foundation. It requires a lot of bracing to stop that racking movement. Now, to be fair, I built it on four by fours and on the Simpson type brackets that are the, the bolt type, which means that all of the weight above that pier is placed on the pier on that bolt. That one inch bolt, well, it's probably not even, probably a three quarter inch bolt. So that means that however many pier blocks you have, that bolt, that all threaded rod under that Simpson bracket or whoever makes it, that's all that's holding up the entire cabin. So that means that you've got one bolt and the whole cabin can wiggle back and forth on top of it. So how do you stop that? 
<laughs> well, a whole lot of bracing. Again, why do I regret it? Number one reason is because of movement or racking in the foundation itself. Right away, when the first walls went up, it became very evident that that, that, that cabin was going to move. You could feel the floor kind of move back and forth. It was very unnerving. So I began doing more bracing. That was step number one. Try to brace it even more. Number two, I actually thought, and, and this is when I look back today, I think kind of silly, but I actually thought, well, maybe when I get some walls up, because those walls would make everything more rigid, maybe that would help, right? A box would be more rigid, more stable than just a floor. Well, that wasn't the case. In fact, the more weight that I put on that floor, the more movement I could feel. It was very unnerving. So I had to put in quite a bit of bracing. I even went so far as to taking three quarter inch OSB, basically plywood, and screwing it between the posts to try to reduce some of that movement, right? Getting it the more rigid. And it never, ever got fully rigid. It just wasn't going to happen. A post and pier foundation, and maybe it's because I built mine a poor way, but a post and pier foundation has to be braced very, very well. Now, I do know that traditionally properly built post and pier foundations can be very solid. I lived in a town at one time called Ocean Falls that the roads were all wood plank roads built on post and pier foundations. They were solid. So yes, you, you can do it, but I would say that from my perspective as a not really experienced cabin builder at the time, I wouldn't do it again. In fact, as an experienced cabin builder now, I wouldn't do it again. I would not put in a post and pair foundation and not just because of the movement. Now, I will tell you this, the, the, and I mentioned this in a previous video, starting to put in a proper foundation as well as that back room, just two eight or 10 foot sections of concrete foundation with a stem wall, I'll tell you what, those actually made the cabin much, much more solid. So just two sections was all it really took to start settling things to a point that I was okay with it, right? Now, another issue with post and pier foundations is that they're up off the ground. Now, that means that you have to enclose them at some point. Now, I haven't enclosed mine because I changed my mind about my foundation and said, I need to build a new foundation underneath the whole cabin. So I thought, well, I'll do that before I enclose it. Well, I kind of regret that at this point as well. I am going to build a new foundation under the cabin, but frankly, I should have enclosed it anyway and deal with the fact that I enclosed it when it comes time to actually do the new foundation. And the reason for that is, with a cabin so high up off the ground, even if it's perfectly stable, you've got all that wind going underneath your cabin. It's open to the elements. That means that it's going to be colder. And though you can insulate the floor, which I did, you're still losing a lot of heat, even though you wouldn't think so, but you really are at the floor itself because that wind can just come right underneath your cabin and take any heat that's down there away. So that, number one, it's not really good. You need to enclose it. Number two, pests. Pests, and that might even be the worst reason to do a post and pier floor, but pests are gonna get in there. And not just bugs, but rats and mice and squirrels and chipmunks and rabbits and everything else. And frankly, I didn't realize when I started building my cabin just how bad it would be. I thought, well, I'll put the insulation up under the floor and I'll get some hardware cloth under there when I can. And I'll, you know, won't be that big of an issue. Well, I never completed the hardware cloth before the rats completed stealing a lot of insulation from me. So... It, that's a constant battle now. And because I haven't finished the foundation that I intended to finish due to various reasons, um, I've got sections of the floor that I've got to go in and re-insulate now and try to get more hardware cloth in there to prevent the rats from stealing it all or put up some foam. And in my current physical condition, crawling around under the cabin becomes an issue. So pests are a big time issue. You're, you're gonna get ants, you're gonna get rats and mice and any other kind of pest you can imagine, including bigger animals like coyotes and cougars hanging out underneath your cabin. 
it's wide open. So it needs to be skirted at the least, but that's not gonna stop the rats and mice and the ants and whatever else. So <laughs> you've got to go under there. And if you're gonna put insulation in it, you gotta fix it. And a lot of people think, well, I'll just put that, that Reflectix under there. I've seen some YouTube videos where a guy just uses Reflectix to insulate his floor. Well, I'm sorry, Reflectix does not have a high R value. Not like you, you might think. It might have an R value of one or two, but it's not even R10. And if you're gonna do a floor, you really, I think, should be at least R10, if not R20 plus, right? Now, I know that codes often call for an R30 to R38 floor, but come on, folks, we're building a cabin in the woods. So my personal experience is an R21 floor is perfectly fine with a small cabin that's heated with a wood stove. Works fine if you can keep the rats from stealing all the insulation. <laughs> Another thing that I think is, is a challenge, and it goes back to it's open to the elements. So yes, this would help if I were to box it all in, and I need to, but you've got P-traps that hang down and pipes that hang down underneath your floor. Well, now they've just got wind coming across them. So you wanna have frozen pipes, leave, it, leave the side skirting off. So primarily, those are the reasons why I regret putting in that foundation. I really need to fix the foundation and I need to enclose the whole thing. And that's something that's harder to do today than 15 years ago when I first built. Had I just bit the bullet and said, you know what, we're gonna build a foundation first, it may have taken me longer to get to building the cabin itself, but I'll tell you what, I would have actually finished the cabin sooner, I think, because I spent more time dealing with that floor movement and all the issues that come with having a post and pier foundation like rats stealing all your insulation, frozen pipes, all that kind of stuff that I probably lost a lot of time by just not doing it the right way in the first place. And I have a friend who's actually coming up to the cabin with me this week. And he, and he said, you know, Eric, I've just learned that you should do it right the first time. And it's funny because he's right. I can't disagree with that. But at the time I thought I was doing it right. Now, I will say that for some things, like for example, wiring and that kind of stuff, I knew I needed to fix that stuff. But at the time, it's just, I, I didn't have time to do it all the right way. It never would have been done. So I suppose in the end, if I've got a message for you, it's if you're gonna build a post and pier foundation, think hard about it. If you're going to do it, I would suggest not using those Simpson brackets like I did, but pouring actual concrete tubes so that when you set your posts they go straight on top of the tube you could put rebar up drill a hole in the bottom of the post set it on there that'll prevent it from moving but if you've got a, a post and i would also re recommend six by six posts not four by fours like i used make sure that those posts sit perfectly flush and flat on top of that concrete obviously you're going to need to put a little insulation underneath them and use pressure treated posts that would be the best but make sure they sit flush and flat and solid on there. That's going to make it a lot harder for that building to move than the way I did it. Something to pay attention to. So what are your thoughts? Have you done the same thing as me? Did you put in a post and pier? Did you regret it later? Let me know what you think. And I appreciate you being here, folks. And do me a favor, if you haven't done it yet, hit that subscribe button. It really helps the channel out. I appreciate you watching, folks. Y'all have a great day. The old jarhead out.